Hi, I'm Michelle LeClair, Executive Director of the Buckham Gallery, a small nonprofit arts organization and artist collective founded in 1984. It is my pleasure to present to you the fifth annual Smallage Lecture with Guy Adamick. Um, this recording was made on October 22nd. About the Smallage Fund for the Arts. The Smallage Family Fund was established in 2015 to honor the memory of Bernice Smallage and her passion for the arts and the arts community in the Flint area. This perpetual restricted fund is maintained by the continual donations of family members and friends. The endowment funds the small, annual Smallage Family Lecture, a yearly arts related talk hosted by Buckham Gallery. Thank you. Master potter Guy Adamick makes objects in order to interpret contemporary attitudes within the context of traditional forms and aesthetics. Predominantly known for his ceramics, Guy's altar vessels, udon drums, and spirit jars become a catalyst between the tangible and the ethereal. Guy is the fire master for the Flint Institute of Arts, teaching pottery, sculpture, and glaze chemistry. He has also taught for Flint Community Schools Mott Adult High School, Mott Community College, and was artist in residence for Kersley Community Schools. In 2004, he started installations for, of public art for the Ruth Mott Foundation in the Flint area. Adamick has brought his 50 years of vessel-oriented pottery experience to his newest exhibition, Ojikagwan Vessels, which was on view at Buckham Gallery. Ojibwa for spirit within, these vessels represent containers for one spirit or vessels to hold an offering for a universal omniscience. I am delighted to introduce Guy and share this recording with you. Thank you. And took it to a level uh, surprising almost everyone. Dave was uh, like no one else that I knew. He built a chimney in my house. He helped me build many of the public art installations, the farmer's market wall. He did the masonry stuff on that, but on Russ Park wall, Boys and Girls Club. So we worked together at length. Uh, Dave's porcelains that he built were nothing like, uh, he tried to throw pots on the wheel. He was too strong. He pushed the clay right off the head. <laughs> but I intentionally brought in a piece of Dave's show an example of what Dave was capable of. So he he would make these elaborate constructions out of porcelain with mitered corners and then decorate them with intricate patterns, just totally opposite of what he was doing in his job. Uh, and they were remarkable. I wish we, we did put together a book of his work and I couldn't find mine and so he, he got a chemistry set for Christmas one year and we went down into the basement, and this was the laundry tub right under the kitchen, and we were mixing chemicals together and burning them to make different colors of fire. You know, we're kids, I was probably eight years old. But how much fun was this? And my mom had yelled down, what's that smell, boys? <laughs> um, later on, we got into, let's make all our own fireworks. So we got into explosives and fireworks and we did all this in the basement. But I look back now, what do I do today? As a glaze chemist, I'm mixing chemicals together, submitting them to fire to make different colors. So in a way, I, you know, you look back, where does this come from? That was great fun. I'm still doing it. When I was in college, even though my parents didn't always know about it, I, I was a free spirit. We start, I started traveling. So we would be sitting around and said, you know, we should go someplace. Let's go to California. And Steve and John said, okay. And we get in a car and drive to California. Uh, we would just do stuff like this. And uh, yeah, my parents knew we were doing this. It's like, wait, we're paying for you to be in college and you're where? Well, we wanted to see San Francisco, you know, so uh, we found about student standby flight. I don't know if you remember this, when they had student standby for airlines, and you could buy a ticket that went to 
half or a third of the price to go anywhere. And you wait until the plane fill up, and if there's extra room, you got to be on it so you can fly really cheap. Of course, gas too was 29 cents a gallon to buy to drive someplace in the whole different world then. Uh, Galesburg, Illinois, where the college was, just happened to be the headquarters for the Burlington Northern Railroad. And they had the largest train yards this side of the Mississippi River there. So we spent, again, I grew up in, in Franklin Park playing in train yards. I, we went to the train yards and started playing around there. Of course, in your train yard, now we're college age, so we could ride freight trains. So we jumped on freight trains. First, we just started riding them down to the downtown and jump off and go to the donut shop. But then, of course, uh, Steve and John and I, we decided, well, we should just stay on one of these and see where it goes. So we started taking longer distance <laughs> train rides and go out west. And being in a, a school like that, I was, it was my first exposure to really professional level artists. It's not college students working next to you. There's some, they had a graduate program in the same studio you're looking at people that are working at a whole different level. And you think you're pretty good at this. And then you go into there and you go, wow, I'm really not very good at this. There's some people who really know what they're doing here. And that's a bigger, valuable experience. A much bigger pond you're in. Um, OK, at that point, I finished uh, college. I got accepted at a couple different places to go to grad school. Uh, my first choice was the University of Minnesota, and I was going to work with Warren McKenzie, who was the best functional potter in the country. And that's what I was doing, I was making functional pots. Uh, I actually went there to his house in Stillwater, Minnesota, we, and brought a box of pottery as a critique. Oh my God, I can imagine somebody doing that to me today. Uh, here, what do you think? Uh, the nicest person. And he said, yes, we would let you in. You could go to school here. We'd love to have you. He said, You're, we are moving the studio from one building to another building. This is not going to be the best year for you to be here. He was totally honest about it. He said, if you're accepted to Cranberry, you should do that. And so that's how I wound up in Michigan at Cranberry. So it's just by chance. You think about how this stuff happens. You know, it's something just random. Anyway, so I came into Cranbrook to check it out. I met a person there who was graduating. I said, hey, do you know any place where you live around here? How do you, I'm looking for a place to, to rent. And he told me about, I wound up renting a house in Kego Harbor on Cass Lake, just by chance. And it was a really good deal because these people, he was a dentist, and this was his summer house on the lake. He only rented to Cranbrook students. And part of the deal is you had to leave Martinburg when you were done. <laughs> so it was a great deal. And it turned out the whole neighborhood was mostly Cranbrook students. It was a great place to live. So for two years when I was at Cranbrook, I lived there. And that was just luck, again. Luck has a lot to do with everything. Cranbrook was a unique experience. You're exposed to top artists. There's quality everywhere. There's quality expected. It was not a school that you're going to teach technique. You're expected to already know all that. Um, here's, here's your studio. You've got an individual room in the studio. There's all the materials in that room. There's the kilns. Show up in three weeks, we'll have a critique. It's like, oh, you know, you're not going to, it's totally up to you. Fifteen students in the uh, um, clay department. Richard DeVore was the instructor. Uh, it was a unique situation and very difficult. But you weren't responsible for doing anything else but making things. We used to joke about it. Cranbrook has a wall. If you've ever been there,
single and my dog. When I west, my friend who started me in pottery, don't shoot him, uh, I helped him build his house. He bought an old settlement house from the area that was built in 1890. Never been to Flint. I was one for, working for Flint schools. I'll never forget driving to Flint the first time. Drove down Saginaw Street. It's like, well, where's the rest of it? <laughs> <laughs> Downtown's like three blocks long. Was like, uh, I was used to bigger city. And Flint is, you know, um, and I'm still here. What year was that? Uh, that would have been 1975. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, feel free to ask questions. I mean, I, this could be informal, so I'm right, just as soon as it was. Um, working for Flint Community Schools, I was teaching 12 classes a week and doing all the firing. Classes then were sponsored by the Mott Foundation, which they eventually pulled out of the classes cost. Well, you were probably in those, John. $19 and $6 for materials for the $25 you could take a clay class. And they were just booming. I mean, there were lots of students. We had one gas still to use for all those people. I would do a bisque in the gas kiln and then two glaze frames and then a bisque for hundreds of people. Yeah, it was really a lot of work. It was kind of crazy amount of work. Um, my boss is John Nash from Flint Schools. John was a great person. I love John as a person. He was a totally ineffective administrator. Okay. He did nothing for the program except I would order materials and they'd pay for it. So in a lot of ways, it was great because I could run the program the way I wanted. <laughs> so, yeah, nothing with having a boss that lets you do what you want. So I couldn't complain about this. So we, we developed enough popularity in the classes that they had to expand. So then we bought an electric kiln. The first electric kilns were in the basement. I had to take everything up and down the hill. Uh, but then they saw the demand and FI was expanding too. They built another kiln room. We had kilns in there. And we I have been through four expansions. The program gets more popular. Um, and they have met the need. So I, I admire that. Where all this comes from? The pots you see here are just a, it's a moment in time. It's all the last, this is all made last two, three months. It's all new work. And if I have a show, I always try and do that. I don't want to show old stuff. It's going to be where my head is at right now. When I got out of, it's always evolved. It should never stop. Um, when I got out of Cranmer, I was making these pieces. My whole thing in Cranmer was experimenting with clay bodies. And I started using a salt kiln to fire at a low temperature. I got these really atmospheric effects from the salt. People said it wouldn't happen, but it did. The salt was still vaporizing even at temperature, and they looked, well, it's hard to describe things. They looked like they'd been buried for a thousand years. <clears throat> I have placed some books over there that I find inspirational. Mingay Chinese, by 13,000 to 500 BC, pots from that era. Uh, those are the kind of surfaces I was attracted to. <clears throat> um, so that's what I came out of Cranbrook doing. At that point, it was all archeological looking things. They, they were balanced, a lot of more double wall construction, so they looked like they were very thick, except they weren't. Um, no glazes, all the surface came out of the clay. So I was mixing things into the clay. I was burying them in a wood kiln in ashes and rags that sol saturated in soluble salts to get all these atmospheric kind of surfaces on them. Uh, those were very, I started showing those at Yaw Gallery, Key Gallery in San Francisco, Exhibit A in Chicago. They were very successful. Nancy Yaw in Birmingham, Loved these pieces. She actually had openings, receptions at her house, the big house in West Bloomingdale, and flew in collectors in their private jets. <laughs> so I see all this happening. It's like, then you have another show, and the stuff doesn't sell as well, and they get pressure.
pressure from these gallery owners. It's like, maybe you should do this. It's like, I don't want to do that. So it was a, it was a point in my life where I made a decision that a lot of people would say is questionable. Do I want to be famous? A big name potter like Peter, Peter Bogus. You could be the most famous potter, Bernard Leach, Peter Bogus, you know, Soji Mata. Uh, how many people have ever heard of you? You know, only a very small community are going to know who you are. Or do I stay in Flint and keep it all local where I can make a much larger impact? And that's what I did. I pulled everything out of the galleries. I made functional pots. I remember doing art fairs in Chicago and thinking, boy, I never want to do this again. This is not fun. <coughs> worst thing you can do for your own art. All the worst stuff sells first. <laughs> the best stuff that you like is sitting there. It rains outside, nobody buys anything. You spend a lot of time and effort, and it's, it's just not worth it. Uh, I remember the last art fair I did, I just took everything off the table, left it in the grass, and just left it there. It's like, I never want to see these pieces. So I stopped. Okay, so I'm teaching. The Art Institute kept growing. Um, I got involved with Buckham Gallery, which is a good place to show. <clears throat> Buckham is not a sales gallery, although we can sell stuff here. It's a place to show your ideas. That's way more important. They, there's no pressure to make stuff to sell here. I can make whatever I want. This is good. This is what I want to do. So I decided to support myself teaching. <clears throat> and making some functional pottery on the side and making art just for me. And so that's the direction. So I've always had the, the line of functional product pots. Uh, <clears throat> Warren McKenzie taught me price things so people can afford them. They're gonna buy them, they're gonna use them, they're gonna break them, and they'll come back and buy another one. <laughs> stuff we get we have people that come to the gallery and put really high prices on stuff and what is the point of that do you want I'm gonna keep making stuff whether I'm gonna sell it or not pretty soon you have way too much stuff <laughs> I was just at, <clears throat> we had the big play here show show here a couple years ago um, we go down to Suzanne and John Stevenson's house Suzanne's still living there she's a I mean, Suzanne's work is, is well known, world class. She taught at Eastern Michigan University. John taught at University of Michigan, the clay department. Um, <clears throat> they have a pole barn in their backyard. We're going to pick up pieces. She probably has 5,000 pieces in a barn in the backyard. She's in her 80s. What's going to happen with that stuff? You know, I don't want to leave that behind. I would just as soon have somebody. Enjoy it. Get rid of it all. I'm going to keep making more. You know? So these are decisions you have to make about what you're going to do. Uh, I've always been vessel oriented. That comes from my Korean instructor. Uh, I make pots. And whether you see them as pots or not, there's still a vessel in there somewhere. They hold things. Um, <clears throat> the surfaces come from climbing mountains in the out west. Living in the desert certainly influenced me a lot. Um, sunsets. I try and duplicate colors of sunsets and stuff on pots. You know, maybe not on these so much, but I mean, those are the things that I look at visually. Uh, the leaves right now in Michigan. Michigan is a great year for colored leaves. You know? And you stand in a, under a tree where it's green in the middle and changes color on the outside. I, I get into it just like spraying cars. You can do this. I can. I always have felt, uh, have approached glazing that any surface imaginable is possible to get on the side of the pot. You may take some experimenting, but I 
you should be able to duplicate one somewhere. Um, okay, I was going to show down at Ferdinand Bloomfield Art Center um, years ago, and it was called uh, Offerings. So there are vessels to make put an offering in. In the meantime, and I brought some of these books to show you guys. Um, I look at a lot of indigenous African, West African art and dwellings. I look at a lot of Native American art. There's things in there that I find really inspirational. The African stuff especially. You look at these people that we call primitive, and I question that. And this is definitely, some of these are highly influenced by this. Uh, almost all their houses have a spirit vessel lying in the corner. They believe all their ancestor spirits live in this vessel. They believe sometime their spirit will be in that vessel. And then their future, their children, the rest of their family, their spirits are going to be in this vessel. What this means is they are aware of a continuum that they are part of. When you, my experience of seeing stuff like this is we are here for just a tiny instant compared to geologic time. When I climb a mountain, I remember the first time doing this, climbing a mountain, standing on the top, I could look back toward Montana, I could see the glaciers in Glacier National Park reflecting the sunlight 200 miles away. You realize how small you are. You realize kind of how insignificant you are compared to the big picture. So these people are primitive in Africa, but they are already aware, uh, they're, they, they've always been aware that they fit into a much larger thing, and they are just here for a little time. So that awareness is something that we have totally lost in this society. We live for the here and now, and just right this, is, we don't think about the past, we don't think about the future, That's, we ruin our environment, you know. These people have lived in harmony with their environment for thousands of years in Africa. I got pictures, they blend to perfectly into the landscape. Almost all of them have an altar out front of their house. And they make an offering on a daily basis. So maybe it's just a cup of green. They make an offering. So what does this offering mean? It means they acknowledge the existence of more than we see. So I don't try and define this. I believe there are more things in this world than we see in our everyday reality. I've had personal experiences that I cannot explain. The most, some of you have heard this story before. The most significant one, we're sitting around the dinner table in Chicago. I'm probably six, something like that. My brother would be 10, sister's 12. My brother blurts out, just out of, out of nowhere, Grandpa just had a car accident. He opened his car door and another car came by and broke it off. And we all look at Tom like, well, that's just a very weird thing to say. <laughs> we, we, we worry about it. It's like, that's odd. Grandpa was on a vacation, and a very common vacation for Chicagoans was to do a circle drive around Lake Michigan. So he drove through Wisconsin, he came here, he took the ferry across where the bridge wasn't there yet, and he came back. Two days later, my mom walks to the corner drugstore because we did not have a telephone. He walked to the corner drugstore to use the pay phone. That's how life was. It's a big deal when we got a phone. But then he couldn't hear anywhere near us. So it's always a jet. <laughs> <laughs> really? Just to that, there's a jet. Life is a series of pauses. Anyway, so my mom calls Julie and Cicero. My grandpa lived in Cicero. And she said, I just got a call from Grandpa. He just had a car accident. He opened his car door and another car came by and broke up. So my brother told us about this three days before it happened. So as a kid, you think about this, but how do you, how do you
do you explain this? Well, you can't explain it. You explain it by thinking there is more going on than we can see. Um, it's not, is it all destiny? Everything planned beforehand? But <clears throat> so time is moving at different speeds in different places. Um, these pots I'm making, especially the big flat disc pieces, this is where it comes from, I see those as altar vessels. The idea of these circles is to create, to make this space more precious. So now you've got this, it's focusing in the energy into these interiors. When you put something in there, even if it's conceptual, just thinking about the you're acknowledging the existence that there's more. You're making an offering. This is, this is what these pots for me are about. <clears throat> I'm trying to find this. I don't want to go into religion or anything else. Like, like she said, I call it a universal omniscience. There is more than we are aware of. I've had other experiences. When my dad passed away, I remember uh, my wife was upstairs in the house in Chicago. Christopher was a little baby. Something woke Angie up. She said, something tapped me on the shoulder. I thought, first it could be Christopher, but then he was too little to move. He's a baby. And she said, I knew instantly it was your dad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stuff happens she can't explain. She said, he said, everything's all right. some of her work which was highly decorated uh, so yeah she was, she was a big influence but then I think technically I showed him how to do it Dave's pieces <coughs> some of them were unbelievably intricate so he, I remember he made a jewelry box it's a chest it's all porcelain it's a chest of drawers curved front drawers like you build out of wood and furniture with drawer guides all out of clay, everything. Nice. I mean, unbelievable, really. But then he decorated with tiny, tiny checkerboards all over. So, it, I mean, and of course, I mean, really, like, how many hours do you have? <laughs> what I, again, what I like about clay, I do believe you can make anything out of clay and you fire it and it becomes permanent. As my students have heard many times, Pay attention to what you make, because in 2,000 years, somebody's going to dig Fine. this up and go, what the hell are they thinking? Uh, but it's, it's the diversity. And, and even at school, what I, what I appreciate. 
appreciate more in a classroom is diversity of everybody doing their own thing. We do have a great show right now of student work up in the front gallery. Uh, I highly recommend going up there to see it if you haven't. Terry, my student Terry right there, Castor, has a has Godzilla in there, <laughs> which is great fun to see. It is. I, I like to challenge students. Uh, you make it, I will fire it. And it's the large, by far the largest piece I've ever fired. Um, and that's just fun. You know. Tell them how tall it is, Ben. Pardon me? I'll tell Ben how tall it is. Oh, it's huge. It's, well, on that festival now, it's got to be past nine feet tall. I mean, this is a big pop. Uh, and that's just fun. But it doesn't, you know, but the, I like the small stuff just as well. Yes? Containing somebody's spirit. No, she wanted to know what my repeat question your, was. Repeat her question, because oh. I don't think everyone heard she it. She asked why some of them are slanted instead of like a planet with a ring around it. Uh, but they're not, none of them are centered, so they're not like planets because they're, all the rings are off center. Uh, some of them are at angles now. So as a spirit vessel, okay, I think, well, if it's a spirit vessel, why shouldn't it reflect the spirit that's inside of there? It's a reflection of the human condition. And some of us, are, some of us are off balance. <laughs> yeah. How'd you get involved in empty bowls? You hold empty bowls for me. Uh, empty bowls uh, started in 1990 with John Harvey, who taught at Lostra High School in Bluefield Hill. I used to fix John's kiln. I went down there to fix his kiln. Asked John, what's he doing with these bowls that the kids are making? He said, we're going to fill them with soup and sell them back to the community, basically the kids' parents, and use the money to go toward feeding people who need it. I said, well, that's a great idea. I think I'm going to do that up in Flint. At that time, John Gargano was teaching for the FIA. I was teaching Flint schools and doing the firing for the FIA. Um, and we made 300 bowls. We brought them down to the Methodist church, used their kitchen made soup, and we sold them all. So that was, we did that for two years, I think, at the church. We decided at that point, I don't want to spend my time making soup. I'm not a soup maker. I'll let somebody else do that. We moved it to the University Pavilion. And instead of making soup, we had everybody get a coupon, good for food at any event, so there'd be a symbol of food in your bowl. We made 500 bowls, then we had meetings. I let the Art, uh, Greater Flint Arts Council, Greg Taylor, kind of took over the logistics of running it. Um, and that was successful, but we usually stalled out at about $7,000 a year. I took the money and split it between the food bank and the women's shelter. So we split the women's shelter. So that was my choice of what to do. Greg. <clears throat> It wasn't growing, it was just kind of stagnant. We had to did the same thing for many years. Food bank approached me, like maybe we could do this event at the food bank. This was before they had the new building. Uh, we moved it over there, and in the, in the first year we doubled the money we made. So we, I said, well, I'll make a thousand bowls. What the hell, you know? Uh, then it grew again. We made, so it, it worked up to making 2,000 bowls a year. It went from like $15,000 to then I just got a report from them. 2016, <clears throat> it was $21,000, then it was $24,000, then it was $25,000. Every year we set a record. The pandemic set us back, but uh, two years ago, we made like almost $50,000 because we got a major donation from a credit union and, just, just, and we did a drive-through event. Last year it was forty-one thousand dollars because that was again an in-person event. Uh, this year was fantastic. Uh, everyone was really thrilled. We just got the numbers back on that. Uh, we set a new record: sixty-eight 
Highly. Another reason I say in Flint, it's this community. There's a thriving art community. I mean, look at this place. You know, it's it's great. Uh, there are, and I've made the comment before, the people who've gone through hardship are the most generous. Flint is a, you know, over the years, it doesn't matter where you are. And I've been all over the country. It's what you do with it. There's good people in Flint. Yes. Uh, history question, I'm going back in history. Were you involved in Walker School when you were Flint School? Uh, back uh, in Walker School, yeah. Mary Runyon, Runyon Pottery Supply. Mary Runyon was the art teacher. Yeah. And she walked from Walker School to the room right across from me. Yeah. Yeah, I fired her. Yeah. Were you there? <laughs> and I, when you start talking about kill, that's what I learned about kill. Because mm -hmm. um, I thought it was spelled kill. Kill. <laughs> kill. Um, but yeah, and I remember going to the park. Probably. Yeah, so Mary Runyon was there. That name was and then they started the business. And since I was ordering all the clay from Flint schools and all the clay materials, and I used to order from Standard Ceramic in Pittsburgh. And then Mary and Paul opened the business here. We had a local supplier. I switched split school to buy all the stuff from local. And that's why we have a local supplier here, because we gave them a big boost. Yeah. And they're the nicest people, you know. And they were ready to have a job like Yes, when you're greater now. Yeah, it's 75. Yeah, it's all kinds of yeah. It's out of the other right room across the hall. <laughs> um, yeah. Flint, when I came here in, back in 75, Flint was the highest per capita income in the nation. The place was booming. It was remarkable. And then it kind of had some issues in between. I think it's all coming back. You know, I think Flint is it's as good as any place. And Michigan, if Michigan had a mountain range on the center of it, <laughs> then it'd be perfect. <laughs> but no, I think I'd rather right now, I look at places like Florida, and you get blown away by a hurricane. <laughs> My sister lives in Arizona. 100 days over 110. It's like, I, you're living in some place, if you didn't have power or air conditioning, it'd be uninhabitable. Uh, we have winter, but... Right. Go what? <laughs> um, I just assume be here than anywhere else. You know, Michigan. Of course, Bill spends the winter in Hawaii. So we, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. yeah, that's not fair. <laughs> uh, we can't all be there. So, I guess, you know, questions. If you have any questions about any pieces, by all means, go ahead and just technical. Or even past, whatever. Let's do it. Thank you so much to Guy Adamick and to the Smallage family for allowing us to um, to share this this work with you. It was really great. Um, and next, I would like to say a big thank you to the individuals and organizations who support Buckham Fine Arts Project and Gallery, including. The Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, Michigan Arts and Culture Council, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Greater Flint Arts Council Share Art Genesee Grant Program, made possible by the Genesee County Arts Education and Cultural Enrichment Millage Funds, your tax dollar network. Thank you.